and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So peace keeps your mind and your heart, which means it is a governor of your thoughts and your feelings. This is very important. Jesus' beard was ripped out of his face. Jesus was brutally tortured. It says that he was chastised for my peace. So if I go and just give away my peace just because someone cuts me off or someone mouths off or someone disrespects me and I go and I take this radically expensive gift and I just trash it for something that is of lesser value, how does that make me look? Does that say, oh, I honor you, Jesus? No, it doesn't. That's like someone gives you a Rolls Royce and you go, no, I don't want that. I want to go to a Honda dealer. I want to trade a Rolls Royce in for the Honda and I want the Honda dealer to keep the change. That's stupid. Peace. It, it means to set at one again. Quietness, it means rest. Now, the word keep here, this is an awesome word because it's not a religious word. It's a military word. In Greek, it's to be a watcher in advance, to protect with a garrison, which is a company of soldiers, and it also means to hem in. So Paul is using a military word when he describes the peace of Christ that is supposed to guard or keep your heart and your mind. What does that mean? It means that peace is a governor of your thoughts and of your feelings. Which means it keeps bad stuff out and good stuff in. It's important because, see, the peace that we have in Christ, that, uh, the peace that we have in Christ, he was brutally tortured. Oh, uh, wait, hold on. The peace we have in Christ that he was brutally tortured for is superior to the intellect and it keeps intruders out and it keeps what needs to be kept safe, secure. Are you following me on that? So this piece is not defensive, it's also offensive. Now you would not think of the word peace as offensive, you would think of peace as defensive. I'm not gonna lose my cool. But not only is it you're not gonna lose your cool, it's you're gonna hold down the fort and you're gonna keep what's good in. So the peace of God is active and it is a governor of our thoughts and our feelings. Now why, why, why thoughts and feelings? Here's why. Because a thought becomes a feeling if you entertain it. Not every thought that you have is your thought. It could be the devil trying to tempt you. Right? Or it could be God trying to speak to you. That's why you have to pay attention to your thoughts and you have to say, I'm going to govern and regulate my thoughts according to this book. See, if I can understand how to think biblically, if I can understand how to basically align my emotions and desires according to this book, then I'm nobody's slave. I can't be controlled. I can't be manipulated and no one's going to tell me to simmer down because I'm going to spend time with Jesus. He's going to give me boldness and what he feels about me is what's going to rule my life, not what other people think about me. Now this is, this is important stuff. Watch, watch what he says in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Paul is saying, think about Jesus. Every one of those, think on these things, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy, Every one of those words is a description in and from the Old Testament of who Jesus is, what Jesus is like, what Jesus has done, and what Jesus is worthy of. So Paul is saying that if you perpetually and continually think about Jesus, it will change how you behave.
let me say it this way. Generally, we are what we think about. You are a sum total of your thoughts. That's why we've been given the mind of Christ. So that we can manifest what? The life of Christ. That's what Paul said. The, you have the mind of Christ. When you begin to believe in Jesus, I, you don't have to come to church for 30 years. The moment you say, Jesus is the Son of God, I'm a sinner, I need Him, or I'm going to crash my, you know, my whole entire life, family, and existence into you know, a barrier on Route 80, and we're all going to go up in flames. So if you realize, yes, I need Jesus, when you believe, He gives you His mind, and He gives you a new heart, and now you've got to walk in the direction that now He's leading you and guiding you, which isn't easy because you're used to walking in another direction. Now, but remember this, the renovation of our minds leads to the transformation of our life. We must remember that our actions are a servant to our thoughts. Why is he telling this guy is in prison? He is in a bad situation. And he's telling them rejoice always. What? Why do we rejoice always? Because God is in a good mood. I know that you never, I, I know that people probably have, maybe some of you have never heard this in your whole entire life. Do you know that God is in a good mood? That God is happy. God is happy. He is happy. Paul cannot tell me to rejoice in the Lord if the Lord has no joy in him for me to rejoice. The Lord is happy. And see, what happens is religion sells this image of God as if God is like in heaven with a fly swatter waiting for you to smoke a cigarette or, or smoke some weed or, do, or say some bad word so he can like slap you with a fly swatter. God has better things to do than that. God is in a good mood and God loves you and God gave his son so that he would have you so that means you're valuable. That's got to start to affect how you think about yourself. You can't define yourself by what you have because what you have will get old. It'll lose value. That doesn't mean you're losing value. Verse 9, Paul tells them to follow his example. This is important because Paul was close enough to the Philippians for them to observe his life and follow his example. If I say to you, follow me, that means I have to be close enough with you that you can observe my life so that you can follow in the good things that I do. Something is not right when leaders want to distance themselves from the people they should be set an example for. Something isn't right with that. Nope. The only way to lead in the kingdom is through example. I'm going to say this again. Something is not right when leaders want to distance themselves from the people they should be setting an example for. I don't see it with Jesus. I don't see it. Jesus re was actively engaged with people. Nobody was smarter, wiser, more powerful than Jesus. And Jesus didn't have a stank attitude like, yo, you're not good enough to hang out with me. Jesus went after people that were broken and were messed up and he showed them how to live. He set them free. He got into their world. He looked them in the face. He sat down at the table with them. He didn't point fingers at them. He extended a hand to them. The only time he pointed fingers at people is when he, the only people he pointed fingers at were the people who pointed fingers. The religious people. Verse 10, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now, okay, we already went over that. 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere in all things I am instructed, both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and suffer need. Uh, being content is something that is learned. 
Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So there are certain things in life that you don't know about until you experience. Like, you don't know about kids until you have a kid. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. You want to go to sleep. And that thing is going berserk. And there's nothing you can do to, to stop it. You, you don't know about love or about patience on that level until you experience that. You don't. But you will. But, you know, it's like people say, like, if I got a million dollars, I wouldn't change. Well, you don't know because you don't have a million dollars. So the reality is you wouldn't change. You would just be exposed for who you really are. Um, being content is learned. It is not earned or given. So that means that, like, if it's learned, that means you have to be taught or instructed. That means that there'll be times where you're doing well and you have a lot, and there also could be times where you have a little and you're not doing well. And here's, here's what I've learned with that. If you don't know how to be content with a little, when you get a lot, you'll be distracted. So if you can't be thankful eating rice and beans, you're going to be funny when you're eating steak and lobster. Right? So what happens is if your, your circumstances distract you when things are hard, when things are easy and things are good, you'll lose your guard and, and you, you won't be alert and you'll lose what you have spiritually. And, and this is what happens. People get a little bit of money, people get a little bit of comfort, and then it's not that they change, it's that they get exposed for who they are. Verse 12. I know how to be abased. That's not a good word. The word there means to humiliate, depress, bring low, to humble yourself, everything that our culture says is not good. This is Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. By the way, this is the best-selling book that has ever been written, just so you know. So this is a best-selling author talking. And this guy is saying, I have learned how to basically be humiliated. Listen, I know what it feels like to be humiliated. I can tell you two weeks ago, you invited us to eat. We really did not have money to go out to eat. Straight up. Do you know how that feels? That's not a good feeling. Now I'm being vulnerable with you. I'm being transparent because I don't have anything to hide. Right? You, you know, we're not starving to death, but I don't have money to go spend 40 50 $60. I didn't have it at that time. That's, that's, that's a humiliating feeling. That's, that's straight up in reality. That sucks. Right? Hello? Are you guys all right? Yes, no? Okay. Are you with me, Sarah? Are you with me? All right, not a good feeling. All right, but if you can be thankful in that state, then you can be authentic when you have a lot. I know how to abound. The word there is super abound to increase enough to spare. Everything and in all things I am instructed. The word instructed there in Greek is also the word initiate. Both to be full and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, if you're going to talk to yourself, this is the kind of stuff that you need to say to yourself. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I want to explain to you what that doesn't mean. We live in a culture that is all mixed up. You got girl. I mean, I go on Facebook and I see stuff and I'm like, that is so retarded. You have girls on Facebook and they're taking selfies with all this cleavage and they're like this, smiling. And then there's like a Bible verse on the bottom of, of, of their Instagram. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with you? That Bible verse has nothing to do with your cleavage. It, no one wants to see that. So either 
take a picture with cleavage or write a Bible verse, but not both because they, they just don't make sense. The same way you'll see a guy and he's lifting weights and it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, let me put three more 50 plates on there and see how much you can do through Christ who strengthens you. You're not going to lift that bar up. What does that mean? This is not what he's saying. It's not saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That gets taken out of context. This verse, this verse is not about motivation. It's not about inspiration. It's about endurance. It means that you can do all things that God has called you to do because God is with you and He's strengthening you to do what He told you to do, not what you want to do. So that means I can't go and do something that I want to do and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, you can't. I'm not going to go try out for the NBA because I'm 31 years old and I'm not going to make it. And I can't misquote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because it's not going to happen. So I cannot manipulate this book to make it say what I want it to say, I have to understand what it says in its context. And when it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, this is Paul talking about, I can have nothing and I can have everything. I can live in Lydia's house in Asia. I can eat good. I can have someone prepare food for me, bring it up to me. I can wear fly clothes because she's a fashionista. She sells silk. And I could be in a jail cell in Rome and I can endure and I cannot quit and I can persevere and I can encourage other people in the midst of my own struggle and my own pain. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can endure the journey that God has set before me. That's, that's what it's saying. And so it's important because you don't want to take things out of context because what happens is, here's what happens. Let, let me tell you one of, the, one of the strategies of the devil. The devil, you know, the devil wants to like live in your house, right? I used to be his roommate. I know all about him. And so some of us used to be roommates with the devil, right? So we know how he rolls. And so he wants to move in. And here's what the devil wants to do to the Christian. What he wants to do to people who are not sure. He wants to kind of get them, you know, like out in the world and stuff. But when you start coming to church, you start wanting to do the right thing. You start, you know, softening up, changing your ways a little bit. Here's what the devil wants to do. The devil wants to put his agenda on your prayer list. Watch this. He wants to put his agenda on your prayer list so you're praying and asking God for things that have nothing to do with God's will for your life. So that when you pray and God doesn't answer those things that are not according to His will, you get mad, angry, and bitter at God and you blame God for God not giving you what you want. Forgetting Christianity is not about what you want. It's about what Jesus wants. So if the devil tries to write his agenda on your prayer list, when those prayers are not answered, you're going to get mad at God and you're going to think God is screwing you or God is cheating you or God owes you something. And that's not the case. I don't even know why I'm saying this. I got off on a tangent. But, but, I, but I know this because I've seen how you can be praying for something, and this happened to me like over the course of the last two years, where there used to be things that are good things. I'm not talking about bad things. I'm not talking about Jesus give me a million dollars, you know, floating from the sky. I'm talking about good things that I used to sincerely pray about that today I can honestly say I have no interest in. I have no interest in things that I used to sincerely pray for because I've grown and I've seen that the things that I, were ask, that I was asking for in reality have no value. 14. Notwithstanding that you done well that you may communicate with my affliction, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but you only. Now he's talking about money. For even in Thessalonica, which is uh, a, another place in Greece, you set, sent once and again to my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Which I'll explain that to you for some of you who don't understand what that means. I'll, I'll give it to you straight. But I have all 
in a bound. I am full, having received of Ephroditus. That name means Venus. He was named after uh, some false god. Uh, the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Now watch this. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, if you've been in church, I'm sure you heard someone twist that scripture as well. If you've ever watched a preacher on TV, they have to use this scripture. This is a money scripture. This is a scripture that people will use to try to get money out of you. And I will tell you what this scripture means in just one minute. Now, to God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you. Chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Now, that word household in, the word, in Greek is the word oikos. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the Greek yogurt? Yeah. Oikos. That's the word. Oikos, which means household, family. Watch. So, Caesar's household, in other words, the people that live under his roof and people who are in his family salute you. So the gospel went from a little shack on a hill in Zion to the most powerful home in the world, to the most powerful family in the world, and these are some of the most evil and wicked people in the world, and the gospel went in, transformed them, and these were the people that were like saluting the Philippians, like saying, hey guys, what's up? Because I, I want you to see how powerful the gospel is. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. We'll finish in just a few minutes. Now, Paul reminds them in verse 14 through 16 that they shared with him in his persecution and his pressure that was on him by giving. He says, you guys have been with me since the beginning of the gospel when it first came to Philippi. No other church has partnered with me on this level. You even sent me a gift when I was in Thessalonica Another, church, another Greek city under Roman rule. What is he saying? He's saying, guys, from the moment the gospel went into your city, you guys have partnered with me. You guys have helped me. All other churches, right, have not helped me, but you guys have helped me. He's saying, you guys have kept it real. So much so that I was in another Greek city, another city in Greece, and you guys sent one of your people to come hit me with money so that I could continue on my journey. These were his people. Like these people, no other church had this relationship with Paul. They were close to him. They stood with him in his persecution. Watch this. 18, 17 and 18, Paul was desiring a gift, not for his sake, but for their sake. He's saying, your giving to me isn't for me, it's for you. Some of you who've been here, and, and some of you who are generous, you know that when you give something, sometimes it's not just for the person that you're giving it to, it's actually for you. Like the way I look at it, right, um, when we go to Haiti and we bless the Haitians, it's not that they just need stuff, it's that I need my heart to be in a position to see other people and to care enough about them to do something because that's good for me. One of the things the Lord told me when I started the ministry was that if you stay engaged with the poor, the, the poor are a purifier because being around need that is always greater than what you have it will always test your motives. He reminds them of who brought the gift and that it was well pleasing in the sight of God. Now, verse 19, this is the money verse. He says this, But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, the word glory is the word doxa. It's where we get the word doxology. And the word riches there, it actually means wealth, like money, right? So, so the glory that emanates off of the person of Christ this is who Jesus is in his ascended state 
he is the richest person in all of the universes. In fact, the scripture says that the silver and the gold are mine, says the Lord. So all of the economies in all of the world, all of that belongs to him who is the creator and sustainer of all things. He is the owner of all of the gold in the Federal Reserve. All right. Now, the promise of provision that Paul makes, because he says, he says this to them. He says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches, his wealth, in glory. In other words, the, the glory that emanates from his person produces wealth. It's not even, you just don't, don't even understand it. It's not natural to understand this in its full implication. But he is the creator and sustainer of of all things. He's the owner of all things. No one created himself. He is uncreated. He is forever. And he says, Paul says, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Alright? What does this mean? The promise here is that if you stand with the persecuted, God will provide for you. That's what this is about. That, who did they stand with? They stood with Paul. Paul was persecuted, what? For the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you stand with the persecuted who are persecuted for Jesus Christ, if you make your interests his interests, he will make his interests your interests. It's not this promise of just like, you know, vain prosperity or just you can name it and claim it or have whatever you want. That's not what this is about. This is about standing with the persecuted, that if you choose to stand with the persecuted, God himself says, I will be your provider. It's powerful. And see, the reason that this is what this is, is you will not find this, this phrase in any other, in any, any other of his epistles. He's speaking directly to people who stand with the persecuted. If you want to prosper, I'm going to tell, I'm going to give you a key. If you want to prosper monetarily, money, I guarantee you, you start giving to people like Voices of the Martyrs, you start giving to ministries that specifically reach out to the persecuted, the people who, the, the father is thrown in jail in a prison in Iran, the father's been in jail for three years, and you feed that family while that man is in jail for Jesus, you will see your finances change. You will see things in your life change because you stand with the persecuted. I Just do it. I don't have anything to gain. I'm, I don't have some kind of thing to the persecuted right now. Go out, find somebody who's trustworthy, and this is real stuff here. He's saying if you stand with the persecuted, you will prosper.